Hello, and welcome to the webinar on Perspectives of Satellite-Based Quantum Communication, brought to you by the International Astronautical Federation Space Communication and Navigation Committee. My name is Rita Lalock, and I'm the current chair of the Space Communications and Navigation Committee. The International Astronautical Federation was founded in 1951, is the world's largest space advocacy body with 521 member organizations from nearly 80 countries, including all space leading agencies, companies, research institutions, universities, societies, associations, institutes, and museums worldwide. Following its motto of connecting all space people and its theme of a space faring world cooperating for the benefit of humanity, the Federation advances knowledge about space, supporting the development and application of space assets by promoting global cooperation. As organizer of the annual International Astronautical Congress for the IAC, or it's called the IAC, which is the world's premier global space event and other thematic events, the IAF actively encourages the development of astronautics for peaceful purposes and supports the dissemination of scientific and technical information related to space. The Space Communications uh, and Navigation Committee's primary role is to organize a symposium for the annual International Astronautical Congress. <clears throat> Our symposium examines the developments in space-based systems, services, applications, and technologies as they relate to communications and navigation. The symposium addresses geostationary, non-geostationary, and extraterrestrial systems and constellations. Navigation topics include position, velocity, and time topics, but time determination and tracking for both relative and inertial reference frames. Communication, communication topics include fixed, broadcast, high throughput, mobile, optical, and quantum communications. The topics of interest of Internet of Things and Machine to Machine are also relative, relevant to our uh, symposium. As an extension of our SCAN committee work, we are planning a series of webinars on topics of interest to the space communications and navigation communities. This webinar on quantum communications is our first effort. If you have questions during the seminar, uh, please put them in the YouTube chat. There are a number of committee members involved in the development of the webinar series. Our moderator today, Dr. Laszlo Pascardi, has been the driving force on organizing our first webinar on quantum communications. Dr. Biscardi is from the Budapest University of Technology and Economics in Hungary, where he is an associate professor at the Department of Network Systems and Services and head of the Mobile Communications and Quantum Technologies Laboratory. He is the leader of the quantum communications activities at the Quantum Information National Laboratory of Hungary. He was recognized with the IAF Young Space Leaders Award in 2017 and elected as a full member of the International Academy of Astronautics in 2022. Dr. Laszlo, Dr. Buxcardi, please take over. Thank you very much, uh, Rita. The quantum communication is a rapidly developing field offering a range of solutions that can be applied to space communications. Since the launch of the world first quantum communication satellite in 2016 by China, a growing number of actors have been looking at how satellites can be uh, used to communicate secularly and how they can be used to build the quantum internet of the future. But even before 2016, there were many activities in the field. Today, with the help of our speakers, we will look at the uh, present and the future of the satellite-based quantum communication. I would like to introduce you our three uh, panelists, starting with uh, Dr. Morio Toyoshima from Japan. Dr. Mario Toyoshima was involved in several space laser communication missions, including grant to satellites, optical and quantum communication experiments using uh, ETS-6, OICTS, SOTA, and the development of the ETS-9 communication payloads. He is now the Director General of the Wireless Networks Research Center in National Institute of Information and Communication Technology, NICT, in Japan. He also serves as the vice chair of the SCAN committee uh, in IEF. Our second speaker will be Robert Beddington from uh, Singapore. Dr. Robert Beddington is the co-founder and the CTO of Spectra, a quantum communication company specializing in satellite quantum key distribution. Satellite QKD is enabling global secure communications that are resilient against hacking by future quantum computers. 
Spectra is a spin-out company from the Center for Quantum Technologies at the National University of Singapore, where Robert was previously a senior research fellow and satellite team lead for the Spooky One CubeSat mission. Spooky One was launched in 2019 and successfully demonstrated quantum entanglement in space. Our third speaker will be Christopher Vasco. Dr. Christopher Vasco is an optical and quantum innovation engineer at the European Space Agency. He works on innovative SATCOM projects, leveraging new technologies for the telecom, security, and scientific applications. The past years, his focus was on high-speed optical SATCOM networks and quantum key distribution systems. While he holds a PhD, while he holds a PhD in applied physics and enjoy engaging in technical projects, his main role is currently supporting the programmatic and strategic development of program on optical and quantum technologies called Skylight. Uh, if you have any questions during uh, the webinar, write in the YouTube chat. At the end of the presentations, we will have a QA and a session as it, as it was announced uh, by the chair of uh, Scan Rita Rolo, and we would be happy to answer your questions. With that, I would like to hand over to Dr. Mario Tayoshima. Mario, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lazlo. Uh, I will share my presentation. Okay, so uh, I would like to uh, present uh, satellite uh, quantum communication in Japan today. So I am Morio Toyoshima of National Institute of Information and Communication Technology, Japan. So here is the outline of my talk. First, I introduce activity on space laser communication in Japan because this technology uh, is a foundation of uh, satellite QKD. And then uh, I describe a little bit about why uh, a satellite QKD needed. And then I'll introduce uh, around the activity on satellite QKD Japan now. Then I conclude uh, my talk. So this just shows the history of uh, uh, space laser communications uh, research and development activity in Japan. So, uh, R&D has started since the 1980s. So first uh, grant uh, to GEO laser communication was conducted between engineering test satellite six uh, called ETS-6 and our NICT optical ground station. After that, uh, first LEO and grant laser com was conducted by using uh, uh, OSET's optical inter satellite link communication experiments uh, developed by uh, JAXA. Then uh, we conducted the first uh, microsat laser comb on board uh, this uh, 50 kilogram size uh, microsatellites. I will show you later in detail. And uh, uh, we are currently uh, developing a 10 gigabps uh, geo and ground laser comb terminal. Uh, this satellite uh, is called ETS-9. So this uh, will be launched uh, 2025. So this shows a uh, uh, laser communication terminal on board uh, 50 kilogram class uh, micro satellites uh, called uh, Socrates satellites. And the laser terminal is called uh, small optical transponder, SOTA. So we developed a 5.9 kilogram mass uh, laser communication terminal including uh, optical part and ele electrical part. So you can see uh, a little bit of twinkling effect of the downlink due to uh, a tracking error and uh, atmospheric turbulence. So we successfully uh, transmitted uh, image taken by onboard camera uh, on micro satellites, uh, like uh, via optical link, uh, like uh, this picture. And then also uh, we conducted successful quantum communication experiment by using uh, this uh, payload. So published in Nature Photonics. So I will show you a little bit uh, by uh, computer graphics. So this satellite called Socrates was launched into a uh, low, Earth, low Earth orbit. Uh, altitude is about uh, five, 500 kilometers. So on board camera we developed uh, can take a picture like this. 
then uh, data are uh, were stored in the microsatellites. When we see the microsatellite from the ground station, so beacon beam was transmitted to a microsatellite, and then immediately a uh, return communication beam was transmitted to a ground station by using a tracking system on board. So we implemented a uh, LDGM code. Uh, this is a family of LDPC code uh, were uh, used, and also we implemented uh, interleaver. So due to uh, atmospheric turbulence like this, uh, some uh, UDP packets are missing like this. Uh, we used the uh, internet protocol UDP packets. So we receive uh, these packets with uh, some uh, missing parts. So then, so received signal uh, produce the image like this. Uh, some parts are missing. But by using a decoder, uh, by using a, a redundant bit and also a, a LDPC, LDGM code, so missing parts, missing packets can be uh, reproduced. Then we can get a complete image uh, like this. So uh, also we initiated a quantum connection experiment. We implemented with coherent parse function on board. So uh, an orthogonal uh, polarization parse were transmitted. So we analyzed the polarization on the ground. And also uh, due to a, a low earth orbit feature, so we initiated international uh, laser communication uh, campaign among several space agencies, NASA, DLR, CUNES, and CSA, and so on. So um, here is a, a video of a real a laser communication experiments for uh, SOTA mission. So we used a one meter aperture uh, optical ground station developed by Japanese manufacturer. So you can see a big uh, optical bench right hand side. So over ten, uh, one uh, ton uh, optical system can be uh, on this bench. So a hyper laser uh, system can be installed in this system. So this is a external view of the optical ground station. So um, we uh, prepared uh, several ground station throughout Japan. So uh, we can uh, control from uh, Tokyo station by using uh, G this kind of uh, GUI remotely. So here is a, a current ongoing uh, development in NICT. So we are developing a small uh, compact laser communication terminal like this. So this uh, terminal can be used for a variety of uh, link scenarios, uh, like a uh, hub uh, optical band station and GeoRail OGS and Leo hubs OGS and drone uh, OGS uh, links. So we also uh, developed a two terabytes, terabps uh, modem for free space uh, laser communication like this. Uh, five uh, wavelengths are uh, used for this purpose. So this uh, system uh, can be used for uh, various uh, purposes in the future. So why uh, satellite QKD is needed? So you can see uh, right-hand side, uh, the graph. Uh, the abscissa shows the uh, uh, transmission distance and the uh, uh, ordinate axis shows the uh, loss of the uh, link. So you can see uh, two uh, lines. One is a uh, uh, free space loss in the uh, uh, atmosphere, for example. So free space propagation is proportional to uh, distance to the minus seconds uh, like this. On the other hand, in the optical fiber, loss uh, increase uh, exponentially because uh, uh, fiber has a loss uh, around uh, 0.2 dB per kilometer. So practical quantum key rate uh, 
could be realized ar around uh, be below around 30 or 40 dB. So um, in the optical fiber, uh, it is the uh, uh, longest distance at uh, 150 kilometer to relay the quantum key. So this means uh, every 150 kilometer, uh, we need a QKD relay station worldwide. On the other hand, so for free space loss, so you can see um, around uh, several hundred kilometer, so uh, QKD could be possible. So this means a uh, real satellite can send the quantum key uh, worldwide. So as a summary, uh, transmission distance in optical fiber is limited by the optical loss up to uh, 150 kilometer. So free space uh, transmission is ideal medium for long distance to KD over around a uh, thousand kilometer. So space uh, laser communication technology in addition has been almost matured by several space demonstrations. So then how to share the same key between two orbitary uh, ground stations? So for example, a satellite can share the key alpha between uh, optical ground station A. So alpha, uh, in this case, we, we consider 101, uh, 1001, for example. After the half revolution of the satellites, so satellites also can share the key between another OGS B. So this key, uh, we consider beta uh, 1010. One, uh, uh, one, zero, one, zero. So um, satellite stored uh, each uh, alpha and beta key. So we uh, produce a gamma by using uh, uh, alpha and beta uh, after the XOR. So uh, gamma becomes, uh, you can easily uh, calculate 0011 based on each key. So this gamma can be sent by public uh, public line. So then uh, OGSA already a uh, safe uh, alpha. And also uh, OGSA can receive a gamma uh, via a public uh, wireless link, for example. So then OGSA can know a uh, beta key by using a gamma and alpha like this. So uh, at the same manner, so OGSB uh, saved beta and by using a uh, uh, received gamma, so OGSB also knows uh, alpha uh, 1001. This is a uh, uh, key shared by uh, OGSA. So this shows a uh, uh, compression to share the quantum key, uh, alpha and beta uh, between uh, different OGSA and OGSB. So after the uh, success of a uh, SOTA experiment, uh, R&D quantum cryptography technologies on the satellite communication has been started uh, by funding from the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication, MIC in Japan since uh, 2018. Uh, sorry in Japanese here, but uh, um, this R&D was conducted from uh, 2018 to 2023. Uh, so during this uh, period, so free space uh, optical QKD experiments between uh, transport of optical ground station and uh, Tokyo Sky 3 was uh, conducted. So this horizontal QKD experiment was conducted uh, in December uh, 2022. 20, uh, uh, so this demonstration conducted uh, key sharing with information uh, theoretic security for a uh, three kilometer uh, FSO link between this uh, Tokyo Sky Tree and uh, transportable OGS. So we developed uh, this uh, transportable OGS for uh, this purpose. So uh, specifications uh, as shown here. So this can realize a free space uh, optical communications at any optimum locations with mobile flexibility. So then uh, in this project, uh, uh, 
uh, this is the project, uh, it's called the Secret. Uh, this mission was uh, on board uh, international space stations. So this is a laser terminal uh, on board uh, ISS. So we used the uh, ISS uh, intravehicular activity uh, replaceable the small exposure experiment platform called the IC. So this experiment uh, was uh, started uh, 20, uh, 23 uh, September. So um, demonstration experiment of sharing a secret key using a physical layer encryption protocol using optical communication between ISS and OGS has been started uh, by uh, SkyPerfect JSAT. So JSAT is uh, one of the contractors of R&D project of MIC. So uh, after that, uh, another project was started uh, called the study and development of satellite based QKD. So uh, this project uh, was started uh, since uh, 2021. So targets are uh, to develop uh, onboard satellite cryptographic device and also a tracking system and also a ground station and also uh, research on the integrated operation of satellite QKD. Uh, system and the ground-based QKD system. Uh, this was reported in IEEE ICO uh, conference. Now, uh, NICT is developing optical ground station test bed like this, uh, two, two meter and one meter, 40 centimeter aperture uh, optical ground station and so on. So these are connected by high-speed GigaNet fiber networks aiming for uh, uh, verification of technologies. So this testbed can be used for any purposes. Uh, for example, a UAV and uh, hubs and real constellation and communication and quantum QKD uh, communication so on. So this testbed can be available to all the users worldwide soon. So this is an example of the optical ground station. So this uh, shows a two meter aperture, optical ground station for QKD and the moon and earth communications. We are aiming uh, for uh, these purposes, uh, such as uh, uh, we want to uh, make this uh, be a, a Japan's communication hub for future moon and earth communication and uh, 100 giga PPS plus satellite ground optical communication and also enhancement of quantum key uh, rate for QKD. So uh, this was, uh, uh, development was uh, finished uh, last uh, month, uh, March. So uh, this can be available. And uh, also uh, adaptive optic system was implemented. And this uh, become uh, the largest uh, solid, uh, primary mirror uh, telescope in Japan. And also NICT published a quantum network white paper uh, like this. So a global quantum, uh, quantum network of satellites and also terrestrial networks, including a quantum network and QKD network and the classical network uh, will be established in the future. So maybe budget quantum communication uh, services will be realized according to a variety of quantum networks and protocols. So if you have uh, any uh, interest in this, uh, please uh, download, you can download from this link. So let me conclude as follows. Uh, I explained the uh, recent activity on space laser communication in Japan, a uh, SOTA mission, and compact optical terminal. And then uh, I describe about, uh, described about uh, RD activities on satellite QKD in Japan, including uh, transportable OGS and the horizontal QKD link experiments and the secret mission on ISS, and also a uh, two meter aperture telescope, and also a uh, quantum network flight paper. So it is uh, important to establish the secure communication networks in, uh, in space aiming for beyond 5G and 6G era. 
So worldwide uh, collaborations are inevitable for accelerating the utilization of quantum communications in the future. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, kind uh, uh, listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Morio, for this great overview of the Japanese uh, activities, as well as highlighting the need for satellite-based uh, quantum key distribution and showing us some technical examples, like how to share uh, the same key between different uh, grand uh, stations and that uh, two-meter uh, telescope. That's, that's very uh, impressive. Let's uh, move a little bit uh, further uh, from, uh, from Japan. But uh, not so uh, far. I would like to give the floor to Robert Reddington from uh, Singapore to show us the company's perspective of this work. Thanks, Lasso. Yeah. Um, so, and, and yeah, thanks, Mario, for, for setting up my talk and for, for covering all the, the introduction to, to QKD stuff so I can uh, jump straight in um, and talk about the, the, the satellite QKD initiatives that we've been. Uh, doing here over over in Singapore, um, so both as uh, Spectral and before that as uh, the National University of Singapore. Um, so, jumping into this, um, so so I'm from Spectral and the co-founder of Spectral. So the Spectral's purpose is to, to transform the world's networks for the for the quantum revolution. So this means uh, in the short term, in the short term, we're um, looking to deploy QKD satellites to secure the world's uh, data communications against the, the threat of hacking from quantum computers. And uh, in, in the longer term, we're looking to deploy uh, quantum networks, so to enable entanglement distribution uh, on global scales for the, the networking of quantum computers and the networking of quantum devices uh, and the building out of, of what people are calling uh, the quantum internet. So Spectral, we're a um, group of about 35 people now, mostly uh, engineers, um, optics engineers, quantum engineers, software, electronics, aerospace. Um, as I mentioned, we're a spin out from the, the National University of, of Singapore, so from the, the Center for Quantum Technologies. So these are the, the missions and activities that I'll be talking about today uh, are cover all, all, all of these here. So, so you'll see most of them were from uh, the Center for Quantum Technology. So I'll put up the little CQT logo uh, for all the, the, the slides related to the activities uh, with them. So we'll be talking about the, 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 the CubeSat missions, which we flew back when we were at the university, um, and the miniaturization work, miniaturizing these entangled photon sources, from, um, and how this has led into the, the, the satellite QKD missions, which we're now running as Spectral, as a commercial company. So the, um, first of all, we'll talk about the, like the, the, the setup for this. So the, the, the free space QKD activities that were, were going on um, in Singapore, how that led into those uh, university CubeSat missions that we saw on the previous slide. And then um, the last few slides are on the, the, the space to ground QKD and the, the spectral missions. So from the beginning, so the Center for Quantum Technologies, it's a research institute that was set up back in 2007. So the founding director was, was Arthur Eckert, Professor Arthur Eckert. He's uh, one of the inventors of entanglement based QKD. And he's uh, now on the, the board of directors of spectral. So from the beginning, there's, there's been a, a strong emphasis on quantum entanglement. So there's various different ways that you can do QKD, but one of the, the most interesting ways and the one with the applications to, to future technologies like the, the, the quantum internet is entanglement-based QKD. And what you see in this, um, uh, this, this very long exposure, um, image is you see the blue laser that's firing into um, some crystals here. And these crystals are um, producing pairs of photons. So one blue photon can be split into two red photons that share this spooky uh, entanglement between them, this spooky correlations uh, that cannot be explained by 
um, classical physics or, or by common sense, but which can be leveraged for um, purposes such as, as key distribution um, and um, for, for quantum networking. So as I mentioned, the application today is QKD, but in the future, there are well, when we have quantum repeaters, we are really building out the infrastructure here for a future quantum internet. So the, the, the first efforts in, in Singapore back nearly 20 years ago now were free space QKD demonstrations um, across the campus. This is the NUS campus back then. And the professors had a house here, and this is the department over here. And they had these um, QKD devices, which they connected to um, these to these telescopes, the transmitter there, and the receiver, which is connected to some detectors here. And so these are some of the, the foundational work in free space QKD. You can see they took it on tour. This is the Grand Canyon here. They were doing QKD across the Grand Canyon um, as well. And it was those early QKD demonstrations that were the foundation for the, the university um, satellite program. So the led to the launch in 2016 of, of the correlated photon sources and then 2019 entangled photon sources and now um, to the QKD missions that we're doing. So the, the, the sequence of steps here is basically, first of all, we make pairs of photons. So we, we, we make um, light sources that can produce photon pairs. We then um, make light sources that can produce entangled photon pairs. And we then, as the third step, send those entangled photon pairs from the satellite down to a ground station. Um, so the, the, the first one was really these 10 by 10 centimeter um, experiments that we, we hosted in, in third-party CubeSats. These entangled sources there, we built our own uh, CubeSats. This is the, the 3U GOM space uh, satellite that we built at the university. Uh, and, and now we're back to um, working with, with third-party satellites and, and we're just building the, the, the quantum light sources at Spectral and working with collaborators to, to, to launch them. And where it's yeah, so, so satellite QKD involves uh, sending signals to and from the satellite. For these early demonstrations, there's there's no beams. We're, we're just demonstrating that these entangled light sources work inside the satellite, verifying their performance, making sure that they survive in the space environment, um, and um, leaving these optical links for the future missions, which is the, the missions which we're now working on. So this is the video showing the, the miniaturization efforts at the, the university. So you can see the uh, this is the entangled photon source, which they had as a lab-based setup. So lots of optical elements, the power supplies, and the um, time tagging electronics, and of course the students to, to tweak it all and make sure that it all stays in alignment. So the challenge was really to take all of these devices, um, miniaturize them down, so all the electronics, putting onto a, a small PCB, taking all the optical elements, miniaturizing them, ruggedizing them, packaging them and mounting them together uh, with the electronics to make these small form factor light sources, these 10 by 10 centimeter um, devices um, that could be launched in, in, in two U CubeSats. And so these are the, the, the correlated photon sources that I mentioned. So we're, we're not strictly dealing with entanglement right now. We're just working on making the pairs of photons as the, the first step. Um, so those devices look like this, very tightly integrated, all the electronics on the back there and, and the optics, um, high voltage power supplies on, on the top. And these, these tests were to show, look, we can make this miniaturized, we can make it robust, it can survive vibration tests, it can survive the, the, the launch, uh, we can investigate how it ages in the space environment and how it deals with radiation damage. And, and what's going on in, inside this device? So we have the high voltage power supplies there to power the lasers and the detectors. There's a blue laser diode there which shines into some down conversion crystals 
um, and the lights then sent to some single photon detectors at the other side to, to verify that we're creating the photon pairs. So you can see the, the blue laser there shines into the crystals. Most of the blue light gets dumped into this beam dump here, but occasionally pairs of red photons are born, red and yellow. And, and so the, 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 those red photons then come through to this detection module and they're, they're split between the two um, photon detectors there. And for the, the first devices, we just had a single crystal like this. So this, this single crystal, every so often, there we go, there's the, the photon pairs, the down conversion events, um, creating those pairs of photons. When it comes to making entangled photons, you need some extra crystals in there, and those can um, allow you to have this spooky entanglement between the two photons. And when the, the photons are separated between the two detectors, uh, and the beam splitter there, this spooky entanglement um, is preserved so that measurements that are made on, on one photon will affect the, the state of the other photon. Um, so you can imagine then that if, if one of these uh, detectors here, so one of these detectors stays on the satellite and the, and the other one is sent down to the ground station, then we can have this, this spooky entanglement between the, the satellite and the ground station, and we can use this to create uh, the, the, the QKD keys. So that simple photon pair source was launched on a few different missions, starting on a weather balloon, GOMEX-2 spacecraft, and the Glacier uh, 2U CubeSat. So it's, it's just this, this, this device here, and one of these payloads in here, um, and yeah, this, this one here. And uh, the, the first mission, Comics 2, so that was launched on an ISS resupply mission um, on an Antares launch. So there it is, and off it goes. And a few seconds later, just as it's cleared the tower, bang, the whole rocket exploded. Um, so this was unfortunate. Um, there's the, the, the launch site afterwards. It's quite a mess. Um, so we we wrote up um, an April Fool's paper at that time about the extreme environmental testing of a, a, a rugged correlated photon pair source. But actually, it turned out that the, the, the joke was on us because a bit later, the, the satellite was actually retrieved. It was found on, on somewhere on this beach, I think, nearby. Um, and when we turned it on, the, the whole satellite was working, including the, the photon pair source. So we, we then wrote a, mo a more serious paper on, on the photon pair source that survived uh, a rocket explosion. And you can see that so the, the blue is the uh, after data, red is before. Uh, there's a slight change in performance, but it's still completely functional as a photon pair source. And then, yeah, this is the, the satellite, which we then launched afterwards, the, basically the same device. And this is showing that it works in space. So that led on to the Entangled Photon Pair Source mission, the, the 3U CubeSat, with a larger device making entangled photons. That was Spooky One. That was this device. So we've got more crystals, more devices in there to create the entanglement and to, to measure and verify the entanglement. And that's the mission patch for that. Um, CubeSat. We launched that in 2019 and it had uh, deorbited in 2021. And throughout that time, it was um, producing uh, entangled photon pairs and demonstrating that, that this technology works uh, in the space environment. So that precursor work at uh, CQT was then commercialized. So this, this Spectre mission actually started as a CQT mission and then it was handed over to, to Spectral. Um, that's the uh, the real space to ground QKD uh, missions. So for those, they look a lot more like the the, the pictures that Mario was showing us in the last talk. So you have to have the, the, the pointing beacons and the tracking beacons on, on the satellite and the ground station. It's very um, precise pointing of of the satellite, and whereas. Mario was, was, was showing the, the bright laser pulses, the laser comms. This, these are, of course, the single photon pulses, so very, very weak beams. Um, so all, all the more accuracy that's required um, in, in the pointing system. 
So we have yeah, the two satellite missions we're working on now and for the, the ground stations, we have um, various partners that we're working with um, and many more besides. And this is part of a, a phased approach to deploying QKD networks. So we start with terrestrial fiber-based QKD. So this works for the short distance links. Uh, again, as Mario was showing on the last slide, so, um, they, they work up to about 100 kilometers. After that point, you really need to be using satellites. Um, so we're at the phase now of, of rolling out a terrestrial network in Singapore and putting together the demonstrator missions uh, so that in the future we can operate um, actual um, commercial QQD networks. So for the, the fiber side, we've partnered with Toshiba because they have a very advanced system already. Um, so that we're, we're the solutions partner for them for fiber QQD. And then for satellite QQD, we have two missions that are um, under development right now. So Spectre is a technology demonstrator that's due to launch next year. Um, it's a collaboration with Rail Space in the UK. And then Spectral One is more like the, the, the commercial product demonstrator that will follow on um, about a year after uh, the launch of Spectre. And that's a, a larger, more, more capable mission. And both of those missions will be used as part of the international use cases for QKD uh, program. So this is a ESA program that um, Singapore is able to, to um, to join in thanks to this collaboration between uh, ESA and the Office of Space Technology in Singapore. Spectral is able to collaborate with, with Rear Group in there, and we're actually providing the, the, the space segment for this, this ESA program. And to, to wrap it up, there's just a summary of the, 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 the products and, and devices that we're working on uh, here at Spectral. So the, the QQD satellites, uh, the Entangled photon sources and the weak coherent pulse sources, the optical terminals, the ground receivers. So we have a um, both a, a static ground system as well as this mobile container-based ground system, um, which we can use for these keys of service demonstrations, uh, these um, satellites, uh, sales, hardware sales, technology licenses. So we're happy to operate in all of these ways. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Rob, for this great overview of the Singaporean uh, activities. I still remember the first time when we met at the IEC uh, 2015 in, in Jerusalem, and I'm happy to see the growing Singaporean activities as well as the growth of the Spectra as a company that almost 35 uh, uh, people. That sounds uh, really uh, amazing. And thanks again for showing the, the QKD from company point of view. With that, it's time to go from Asia to uh, to Europe. So I would like to hand over to Christopher Blasco from European Space Agency. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laszlo, and uh, thank you everybody for, for joining us today online. Um, I would like to start with a little preface. It is extremely encouraging to see what is happening on an international scale uh, on the topic of uh, quantum technologies. And uh, I myself am a product of uh, these past decades of uh, a rapid evolution uh, from uh, ideas being born, uh, tested in labs to actually flying on satellites like Spooky or being embedded in massive test beds in, in Japan. It is uh, thrilling to see. Uh, I was also there in the IEF uh, uh, IC 2015 as a young space leader. And uh, it's mind blowing that in the past uh, decade, uh, you've seen yourself the growth uh, uh, in this field. Um, today I'm here uh, representing a large team and I'm uh, very grateful for the IEF for the invitation. Uh, the invitation was for my, for my boss, Dr. Harald Hauschild, who unfortunately uh, cannot be here today. Uh, we work in, uh, in Europe at the European Space Agency uh, in the Directorate of Connectivity and Secure Communication in the Netherlands. And our main task is uh, to try to bring together a lot of these technological activities that you have seen uh, from our uh, member states. Uh, our member states are, for those who don't know ESA, uh, not only European, we also have a strong can Canadian uh, contribution. Uh, we collaborate internationally, uh, but of course our main uh, mission is to explore technologies uh, for 
European capability building and European access to space. So quantum is a big topic uh, here. And uh, if I hadn't been prefaced so excellently by Morio san and Robert, uh, I would say uh, we, are, we are just all trying to look into the crystal ball to try to figure out what is down the road uh, when it comes to quantum communication. Uh, I deliberately left this slide very blank because um, in general terms, QKD is the first uh, technology that we think about when we talk about quantum communications, but it is certainly not fully representative of what, what quantum communications will be one day. So that's why I put the magical crystal ball there. Uh, but as you can see, the astronaut has a, a quite a, a high-tech suit and looks quite realistic. Um, the big challenge is not necessarily going to be today to figure out what uh, is going to be in that crystal ball happening in 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, no one can really do that. But the big challenge is, is that whatever we will be doing will require space. And this is what we've heard today already uh, from both of the uh, speakers before me. We will require space technology to be ready when new applications emerge. And that is a challenge in itself because the communities don't speak the same language. And if I were to communicate today um, an analogy um, to where we are with quantum communication, I would start with optical communication. Optical communication is at the, at the moment a bit beyond the stage of connecting the first computers, which was in the 80s, to form the first internal networks. That's where we are. We are able to connect with optical links, ground and space assets together and have them communicate in two ways. And this is great, but it still bears a lot of challenges, as you've seen uh, uh, from Morio san as well as from, from Robert, it's not so easy to do that. And this is just the basics for quantum communication down the road, because what you're doing now, instead of abusing uh, little electrons, as we're doing it right now, you're actually playing with light particles. And those light particles can be absorbed and emitted in the atmosphere when you try to communicate. They get lost. They need to be guided. And the big problem is, is that if you manipulate an entangled photon, if you do anything with it, if you just measure its existence, you're breaking entanglement. So this bears challenges that requires us to be uh, very aware of the developments uh, all around the world. Um, our Director General Josef Aschbacher has uh, recognized this already a few years ago when he took up office and he formulated uh, his strategy. He calls it the Agenda 2025. Uh, if you check very closely, um, you're soon there. Uh, so we've got to... Uh, 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 tie up uh, all these activities and look forward what the DG wants to do as next. But as you can notice in the center of it, quantum technologies was there from the very beginning um, for ESA. And uh, uh, the, the top priorities he set for the agency uh, was amongst others to strengthen the relations with the European Union, but also to boost this commercialization uh, that we will need uh, in order to be able to to really support European industry. So if you're interested in his uh, tech strategy, you can download it from here. But uh, for quantum, uh, this is the landscape that we have had uh, now almost two years ago. Um, we have seen a lot of investment in the whole world into quantum technologies. And I don't need to focus right now anymore on what is quantum or uh, uh, what the term is. The only thing I want to there are two things I'd like you to take away from this slide. One of them is, is that QKD is the first uh, application where we can start quantifying a business case uh, for it. Uh, QKD has a great promise uh, to increase and enhance security for optical communications or for normal communications. But it is by no means the proverbial apple that uh, we have to go for. We really have to work a lot with the users to determine uh, and prove its security validity because Security doesn't start and end with your key. <laughs> uh, security is much more than that. It starts with the user, the authentication. How do you use that key to communicate? What kind of processes do you use to authenticate each other? There's a lot of things to be done, but you would say 36 billion US dollars on a global scale is impressive. And mind you, this is um, from public source. So this is only published budgets. So we don't necessarily know what really is being spent. But if you were to say that this is a lot of money, think again. Just the annual public uh, revenue of a global telecom provider is almost four times that sum, maybe three times if you want to be conservative. So there is a lot of growth there. And this is a reason why ESA agencies all around the world 
have to be able to support uh, uh, the development of quantum technologies. Uh, but because we do not have a business case or we don't have to build a product at the end of the day, we can focus on a higher level on other things in quantum technologies. For us, there is a, a big interest in fundamental physics and science to engage with quantum technologies. Uh, we want to do high precision measurements. So there are now sensors that can exploit entanglement, very similar to how QQD operates with hardware, such as the light sources that uh, Rob presented to us, uh, in order to be, become even more precise in the measurements. So we are leveraging and exploiting um, existing technology that we know and we improve it by adding quantum technologies to it. Uh, we can play around with new ideas. As you see, QKD is a big topic, but also quantum computing. The moment we have uh, fault-corrected quantum computers that can run stably, we could start thinking about how do you connect several of these devices. So there is a lot where quantum technology comes to mind. Um, but of course, as we are an agency, uh, what we need to do is we need to make sure that the European and Canadian uh, companies are uh, on the table when it comes on a, to a global discussion with this. Uh, and of course, we need to be very careful that the wheel is not probably reinvented in every single lab. And that actually is one of the things we are doing already today. Uh, we engage with all kinds of stakeholders around the world to, be sh to ensure that people don't uh, want to launch a 10 billion euro cryostat uh, into space just because they didn't realize how complicated this could be. We provide funding uh, and we engage with stakeholders. This is has already expertly been uh, discussed uh, beforehand, so I'm just going to skip over this. We, we are clear that whatever the quantum communication of the future will be, we need quantum-capable satellites. And what you need to keep in mind is space is hard. Sp space is still very hard. Uh, even though you can build a rugged little source, uh, a CubeSat that survives the explosion of uh, uh, a rocket that is a very rugged device and this is what you need to be able to go to space so we need to start today to be sure that these technologies exist that they are reliable and that they work and a small example here um, the quadratic loss that you would calculate when you come from space um, this is the loss that you have in your signal if you put a one meter telescope on the surface of the moon uh, you would be able to communicate over distances of 40,000 kilometers uh, 400,000 kilometers and that would be roughly the same loss you're facing in the 270 kilometer cable. So optics and photonics are there and are really necessary to be rugged. So this summarizes it. Uh, uh, we are now having QKD networks all over the, the world. They're connecting uh, critical infrastructure, banks, institutions. Uh, and we are now starting to see that by 2040, quantum, quantum information networks will be a backbone of uh, uh, these networks. There will be functions uh, or services where you connect clocks with each other, maybe even quantum computers, sensors, you synchronize time. Uh, and for that, we need to have satellites uh, that can connect over long distances. What are we doing today is continuing a development that we have begun two decades ago with optical communications. Um, we, are, we are looking to mature photonic components that can go into space on board of satellites in a program that we call Skylight. This is uh, where I work, and we're trying to uh, bring space assets. We're talking about LEO very often in these experiments. So we are now trying to bring optical communications from the ground to geo and back again, and eventually even to deep space, if that is possible. Uh, and of course, we are trying to do this with a, with a strong eye on future uh, quantum technologies and their potential needs. Uh, we have been quite successful in doing it so far. European and Canadian companies uh, are competing on a global scale in photonics. But of course, uh, quantum communications is, is still a huge uh, step ahead. Uh, we recently had uh, the world's first bidirectional optical link uh, with uh, uh, a little device that we have developed here with the Netherlands and together with Airbus. Uh, we are about to uh, engage in a demonstrator system for the fully optical uh, network that uh, aims at 100 gigabits or more data rates. Uh, we have dozens of activities in parallel going uh, uh, at the moment at the European Space Agency under Skylight that deal with photonic development, with optics, with uh, quantum technologies. And of course, we also have SAGA, the Secure and Cryptographic Mission, uh, which is... Uh, a collaboration between the European Space Agency and the European Commission uh, to provide a quantum key distribution service 
for an initiative of the European uh, Union called European Quantum Communication Infrastructure, the Euro QCI. Uh, here, we are trying to do uh, the same thing that uh, Rob and his team and uh, uh, Morio uh, are engaged in. Uh, we need to mature this technology and we also need to learn why this is happening so that we can avoid pitfalls down the, down the way. And we are also all, all already looking at the in-orbit validation for these big anchor customers, which are uh, institutions. Uh, SAGA itself, just very quickly, is also a prepare and measure satellite. You've heard now uh, quite well how prepare and measure works. Uh, uh, we have a dedicated ground segment that looks very similar to the test that we have seen presented earlier. Uh, and we really uh, are open to uh, move this uh, first step, this first generation into true entanglement uh, for uh, satellites. By the way, if you go to AI and you ask it, make me an optical satellite in orbit providing entanglement for Earth, this is not the image you are getting. So we are so far away from the public eye at the moment of what we are doing that this engagement that Saga brings, also with institutional stakeholders who know very well, is really spot on and needed. And I'm almost there now. Um, at the moment, we are engaging in, in uh, this uh, high throughput optical network. So we are trying to connect uh, uh, low Earth orbit satellites uh, with optics and photonics to each other. And the next step would then be to do that with uh, uh, quantum uh, signals. The main idea you might be asking why do you need such a complicated system is a very simple one. Um, at the moment, we cannot bridge the oceans. That is, that is the biggest issue for uh, moving a quantum signal uh, on long distances. Between metropolitan areas, even if you have a magic trick up your sleeve and you have a so-called quantum repeater, a device that can amplify signals without interfering with your quantum states, even if we had that, the recent study that we conducted showed that the limitation uh, would be by introducing noise into your system. Every time you take a signal and you amplify it and you move it on, you're introducing more noise. And at the moment, you probably have four or five steps before the noise becomes so strong that you lose your signal anyway. So the satellites will need to have this flexibility that, uh, that Rob has been showing you, like the ruggedness, the, the quick interconnectivity. They have to be cheap, they have to be fast, and they have to be very reliable. And agency missions such as Hydron, or maybe even its extension to deep space, to lunar orbit, uh, are uh, ideas where we can challenge our commercial partners and uh, bring them closer to uh, uh, our needs uh, at the moment. Um, as a summary, um, we are at the beginning uh, of a journey, uh, all of us, and I would like to uh, very strongly repeat uh, uh, Morio-san's statement that we need cooperation, we need collaboration, we need ideas how to do this together because we are now in the process of developing all these tiny steps uh, for technologies that in the end have to collaborate in the harshest environment that they know. They have to, there have to be standards, there have to be common practices, and there has to be a clear understanding of what we are doing. Um, and we see our role as being a coherent and unified, uh, unified provider of a quantum strategy for our member states. Uh, and with that, um, I think I'm done. I would like to do a bit of self-promotion. We also have a, a, our own conference on optical and quantum technologies. So if you want to hear more from uh, Rob and Morio, who are also hopefully coming and joining our conference, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And with that, thank you very much, uh, Laszlo. Thank you very much, Christopher, for this great presentation and to highlighting the European uh, activities in this field and sharing with us the European plans, including the Euroku, CI, Saga, and, uh, and Hydron. And now it's uh, time for questions and answers. So if you have any questions, please write in the YouTube uh, chat. And we already received uh, some questions, so I uh, would like to start with a question to Morio. You mentioned uh, in your presentation the transportable grand uh, stations, and what is your uh, opinion? Countries who does not currently have satellite quantum communication capabilities should go for transportable OGS or fixed optical grand stations. Thank you very much for your question. Oh. I think for the um, some uh, countries uh, who has the uh, not uh, well development about uh, QKD or satellites or something. So uh, first uh, to test uh, 
uh, to use a transportable OGS first, maybe, uh, and then maybe uh, we can collaboratively uh, uh, evaluate something, a cytodiversity effect among uh, several countries, for example, then uh, this country can decide uh, to uh, introduce this technology or to develop this technology in this uh, in a country or not. Or, but uh, uh, we need to uh, understand the technology and we need to gather something uh, 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 accustomed to uh, use this kind of technology uh, in their uh, uh, environment. So maybe uh, first TOGS uh, will be very useful for uh, fast trial or fast usage uh, for this uh, satellite QKD technology. Thank you very much, uh, Morio. Rob, I have a question to you as uh, well. How do you see the commercial market adopting to quantum key distribution at the moment? And what is next for Spectra after the QKD? Yeah, well, I can. Um, so I think the commercial market, the, the the interactions we're having is that they're curious to to try this. So following on from Mario is actually we're, we're now using transportable OGS um, that we're leasing out to people that um, are interested in this. Um, so we have a financial services institute that that signed up for. Um, deployment of, of, of our transportable ground stations because they, they don't want to, to commit to, to a, a, a full satellite QKD service right now, but they, they want to try it and then the transportable uh, ground station uh, for a short period of time lets them do that. So yeah, there, there's certainly interest in, in financial um, services. Um, there's other groups that, that, that are talking to us um, from that sector. Um, government, of course, is, is another one, but uh, um, the, the place to, where this is all already happening right now, of course, is China. So, so China has um, big QQD networks already. They have quantum satellites already. They have um, all sorts of users that are, are using QQD right now. So um, that, that's yeah, probably where the rest of the world will be five or ten years from now. Oh, the, and then, then you asked what was after QKD, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, well, the, the, that's the, the, the quantum inter internet and you know, the quantum networking and, and um, uh, all those good things. So that's, um, uh, Chris mentioned it a, a, a bit in his talk, but, you know, there's applications beyond QKD. We don't exactly know what all of them are yet, but some of them might be like um, uh, long baseline uh, telescopy, so um, interfering telescopes to produce very high resolution images um, uh, by um, interfering the, the two, two telescopes together, um, but also yeah, networking quantum computers, networking quantum devices. There's, yeah, we, we know that sharing entanglement around the world is going to be very useful. We just don't know exactly how um, we, we can't exactly define the applications right now. But it's, it's the same way that when um, Alan, uh, you know, when, when Turing was building the first computers back in, in, in the 40s, you couldn't have predicted all the benefits that you would get from building the internet out today. Uh, it's, it's the same kind of time frame uh, now. For quantum computers, we're building out the very early quantum computers. We know that if we net the work these together, we're going to have some amazing uh, technologies that come out of it but um, predicting exactly what that is right now is a bit hard to see. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. I, uh, now I would like to turn to uh, Chris. Similarly to, uh, to Rob, you mentioned that uh, QKD is only the first step in quantum communication, and many of us are looking for the next step, building the quantum uh, internet. What kind of quantum memory platforms are envisaged in the space environment? What type of quantum memories could be used on board of satellites? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Thank you for the question. That's a very good one. Maybe I, I, I roll it back first because quantum internet is a, is a very wide uh, uh, term and we might not all be on the same side, but in order to get uh, uh, to a higher understanding, we first need to, of course, go step by step by step uh, in connecting quantum devices. So the first would be a trusted repeater, then you do prepare and measure QKD, you generate entanglement, then you start dabbling with those quantum memories. Uh, and then hopefully you can generate qubits that are fault tolerant, and then you go into quantum computing. That's more or less the functionality increase uh, that we're looking at. And this question is spot on. Uh, a quantum memory on board of a satellite is a massive challenge. Um, mainly because uh, the, the things that we see very promising at the moment uh, is... Uh, requiring uh, uh, cryogenic uh, uh, cooling, cryogenic cooling, and those are the, the rare earth uh, ion dope crystals, the RIAC type of quantum memories. Um, the reason for that is that they have good optical transitions uh, uh, that, that we can use rather easily, um, but uh, there are a number of things that we would need to be able to bring to very high levels of maturity to be able to use them uh, uh, reliably and mostly it's we need a very very bright entangled uh, uh, photon source uh, so we need a lot of photons to do that um, we need very high magnetic fields we need cryogenic cooling so that's a, a quite a, a, a big challenge for the quantum memory uh, we've looked at uh, color centers in diamonds um, those are fantastic because uh, what can be more rugged than a diamond to fly to space um, but there the storage times are are very very short at the moment uh, we looked at cold atom assembles. They, th those ensembles um, are, of course, very interesting. And we've got some space uh, uh, hardware there as well already for uh, clocks. Uh, but uh, also there, the storage time at the moment is very short. And I think to rephrase the question, um, we are having these discussions with the community now to find out which one of these parallel technologies in the field is going to be able to have minutes uh, five to 10, maybe even 40 to 50 minutes of storage time. Once we have technologies like that, uh, we could probably answer this question with a bit more uh, clarity. Thank you very much, Chris, for this uh, clarification. And I have a question to, to all of you. The motto of the IEF is uh, connecting all space people. And I was really happy to see that all of you mentioned internet, international collaboration in your presentations. But could you share with us how easy or maybe how hard is to collaborate internationally in the field of satellite-based quantum communication? I don't know who wants to, to start to answer. Morio? Maybe. Uh, this is, OK, this is Morio speaking. So uh, we had uh, already uh, several international uh, collaboration among uh, NASA, ESA, DLR, CUNES, and so on, so far. So uh, it is important uh, to have international collaboration to enhance the uh, uh, development, uh, uh, any any reason, for example, by funding and any, any reason. But uh, uh, a possible uh, difficulty will be uh, some kind of export control issue among the countries. So maybe uh, if we can overcome this issue, so maybe we can uh, more easy, easily uh, collaborate each other. So maybe we uh, together, uh, we have to overcome uh, this kind of issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. I wanted directly to answer to, to Morio's proposal. I think it's very, very good indeed. I think a key challenge is, is that the moment you, you open your mind to uh, what is next uh, beyond quantum uh, key distribution and you go away from security sensitive topics, uh, we are able to collaborate much easier because the biggest challenge at the moment is indeed try to go to a lab and tell a couple of master students working very enthusiastically on a little master source that they cannot use Google Docs. It is, it is a challenge uh, technology wise. Uh, and th the moment you have, let's say, uh, we are at the moment facing this wall of very, very steep learning curves. 
I think in a few years, it's going to be much easier um, once some technologies have matured a bit more. And uh, I think uh, Rob is doing his best with his team uh, uh, to break that wall down and uh, make platforms like his available and affordable to labs. But uh, I didn't want to interrupt you, Rob. Please go ahead. Um yeah that's um yeah absolutely agree um you know, as singapore we're like an island i mean we're a city state so um the, the yeah we have no use for uh, satellite UKD within the island of singapore so we we have to, to to work internationally um um and yeah things like export control uh, and uh, these these things do make it challenging um now singapore is obviously fairly open they, they they have to be um and so we just have to find the the, the countries that are, are willing to work with us um but yeah as, as you say it becomes a lot easier when you stop stop talking about uh, keys and encryption and you start talking about entanglement that uh, does um certainly open things up and we, we have a few collaborations along those lines um but yeah the, the, there's also then um yeah, the sort of, um, the the commercial side may be less bothered. It's just when regulations and um, uh, rules start to come in that they may then um, be constrained in, in which options they can select. Yeah, we'll, we'll cross those bridges when we come to them. Thank you very much for your answers. Uh, so, Sebastian, you have a question for your uh, interesting presentations. And with that, I would like to. Uh, give the floor back to Rita Rolok, Chair of the IES Space Communication and Navigation Committee. Rita. Thank you, Laszlo. And I would like to definitely thank the IAF for sponsoring and uh, supporting our webinar. Uh, I would definitely like to thank you, Laszlo, for being the organizer and putting together uh, such a fabulous panel uh, and being our moderator. Thank you very much. Uh, but lastly, of course, our speakers, thank you very much for informative presentations. Uh, it's been a really interesting first webinar for our committee and also on an extremely uh, important topic. So thank you all very much. Uh, this concludes our webinar for uh, the Space Communications and Navigation Committee. Thank you.